All right. A few weeks ago, Jesse, Pastor Jesse Shook was here, and he, he basically preached on, how many of you remember he started off with, uh, when he was in youth group, they would play Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. Remember that? And so he basically preached that in the, our day and time, we have got to recognize the truth. And tonight, I'm going to basically uh, teach us how we have to defend the truth of the Scripture and the Bible and the message of Jesus. So that's where I want to go. I'm going to pray real quick. Father, I pray for your help tonight. I pray you organize my thoughts and I give them to you. And I pray for this message that I'll say what you want me to say and we'll trust you that it'll come out the way you want. In Jesus' name, amen. Normally when I preach this message, well, actually I usually, have, I usually teach it six weeks and 45 minutes per session. So we're going to squeeze that in tonight. Are y'all confident? So you got to listen fast. Buckle up. Are you ready? Okay, I'm only going to tackle one of those sessions tonight. But um, the, uh, I have known Pastor Jesse Shook since he was probably six, right, Becky? I mean, Becky and I have been married 33 years. And when he was here a couple weeks ago, uh, I was sitting on the third row, and we know Jesse since he was a little boy. And he started off by saying he's a preacher's kid. And then he started down, you know, where he's telling a story. And I thought he said, how many of you in here know me already? Well, I'm on the third row and like an idiot, I'm going, yeah, I know Jesse. I've known him since he was six. And then I looked around and then Becky said, that's not what he said, Ken. <laughs> Felt like a goofball. That's why I waved so vigorously to my friend Jesse. But I actually went on a, Becky and I, our first year of marriage, did a six, no, uh, it was more than a month-long tent meeting with his dad, Pastor Al Shook, and I've been to other countries with his dad, and so I've known Jesse a long time. But I loved his message, and it stirred me deeply on how can we know the truth. And not just that, here's the more, in my mind, equally important, how can we tell other people the truth in this day and time. How do we do that? And so um, I know I've probably told something about this. I started my career off uh, in Germany as a young missionary, and I think there are some Germans in the house. Haben wir heute Abend eine deutsche Eck? Wenn du hier bist, du kommst aus Deutschland, schönen guten Abend. Ooh, how cool. Good to have Germans here. I started off, this church is blessed with a lot of Germans. Uh, I started off my career in Germany as a young missionary, and I learned something very quickly. I had been primarily talking to American teenagers about Jesus out on the streets here in Burleson and the parks and different places. And so I learned their language and I learned how to talk to American teenagers. And then I uprooted and moved 6,000 miles away to Germany. And what I learned uh, back in 1984 and 85 when I lived there, and to this day since, or at least to the last time I was there in 2013, and Becky and I have spent months and months and months and months at a time there in all those years, in Germany, when I walk up to a person and I begin to talk to them, the subject of Jesus, when I get to that word, the J word, Jesus, I kind of step back a little, make a little room, because I know most times, nine times out of 10, probably 99 times out of 100, there's a little explosion getting ready to happen. And they will say to me, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in the church. I don't believe in the Bible. I don't, what about the crusades in Africa? What about the starving children? What about this, 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 this? And they have this thing that's been going on in their heart and their mind. And they are basically in their mind and the things, uh, the things of God, the things about Jesus, they are 100% against my message from the first second. And I'm used to it. And so 
You know, what are you going to do at that point? Well, you could just say, well, uh, I don't want to argue. I'll leave you alone and walk away. You could do that, but they're still going to stay on what Jesus called the broad road that leads to destruction. And that's not where I want to leave them. So what I've learned to do in Germany, take a step back, look at my watch. It's going to take about five minutes usually. And when they've had their say, I say, well, that's interesting. I, I, you know, I agree with you about a lot of those things you just brought up, the crusades and starving children in Africa. I let them, and I say, but you know, what I really came to talk to you about is the person Jesus. What he said what did he do? What, what, what was he really all about? And then we start over. And Becky and I have so many pictures. And oh, can you put Germany up there? Where you go? That's when I went, wow. Wow, I was skinny back then. Anyway, I've expanded my role as an evangelist over the years. But that's where I started my uh, missionary career in Germany, preaching on the street and witnessing to people one on one. And the thing is, I learned. That Now, I want to have a conversation with this person, and I want to help them understand who Jesus Christ really is, because they have a whole lot of wrong ideas. They have a whole lot of mis... mis they've got preconceptions. They've got ideas in their heart and their mind that, that they've been taught, and most of them are not accurate, and I want to bring them farther than when we started. And I can show you a hundred pictures tonight. I'm not going to of that particular thing. But Becky and I, this person who we start off with so negatively, an hour later, we can't get rid of them. They won't go away. Because the things they thought about Jesus blow their mind when they find out who he really was and what he really did and what he really said. The person of Jesus is the most mind, the most magnetic thing in the entire universe to the human heart. But they've got to have the right idea of who he really is. Not a bunch of uh, propaganda that they've been fed uh, a lot of times by culture. And so I start with them. Everything I believe, they don't like, at least at the beginning. Hour later, they will not go away. Hour later, they're all smiles. An hour later, they, uh, and I say this all the time, Germans have something to do, kind of a, a little nervous saying sometime when they don't know what to say or do, and we're leaving, and we've been talking for an hour about the Bible and about Jesus and about the message of Jesus, and I'm ready to move on and talk to other people. I've taken them as far as I can go, which I always think, get them, I get them to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, 10 seconds to the kingdom, and then I, I need to move on to other people. And you know what? Germans will, and they'll be following Becky and I down the street. Oh, ich wünsche dir alle Gute. Ich wünsche dir alle Gute. Oh, ich wünsche dir alle Gute. I wish you everything good. Which in my mind is a pretty productive hour considering where they started. So tonight I want to talk about the subject some of you may have heard of called apologetics. And uh, what I do on college campuses, and I don't remember what slide is next. You can put one up there. But apologetics is defending the faith, telling people the truth about the faith. That's what it looks like on college campuses. Uh, you can see there at the top slide, that's early in the day. And then the left slide, it's getting a little bigger. And by the end of the day, that's a good day right there. That was at Texas State. And then... The one on the other side is Texas State. But, you know, I preach on college campuses, so it's basically the same thing I did in Germany, except in an American college campus, uh, oftentimes it's uh, quite a bit more hostile when we begin. So how do you take somebody who has all these ideas that make them think they don't like Jesus or Christianity and bring them forward? So tonight... I'll say this, whether I'm in Germany, what puts a smile on their face when I answer their questions? When I'm on a college campus and the crowd is against me, but by the end of the day, and I've been on college campuses till 7, 8 p.m. at night, they won't leave either. What does that? 
I answer their questions about Christianity. And every one of us could do that as Christians if we learn a few basic subjects. Now, don't get to thinking, oh, Ken's going to go all high scholar on me. No, I like to take things that people think are really complicated and show you how simple they really, really are. And so tonight I want to talk about just the first one. If people don't believe the Bible, and they don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, how do you defend that with somebody? So I got a lot to squeeze in. So y'all listen fast, okay? All right, Jude chapter, uh, Jude, there's only one chapter, verse 3. Ready? Dear friends, we up there? Good. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. That's essentially what Jesse uh, preached on a few weeks ago, contending for the faith. This, this writer, Jude, said, I just wanted to talk to you about salvation, but he knew that a lot of misinformation and garbage and fake news had presented itself, making the gospel unattractive to a lot of people. And he said, I wanted just to talk about that simple thing, but I felt that I had to help you contend. I urge you, and tonight I'm here to urge you to contend for the faith. That word contend is Paul, in his culture, that word contend is what we would think of as Roman Greco wrestling. Gave you some good pictures there at the bottom, right? That word contend, I, I ha we have to contend for the faith. Now, how many of you wake up in the morning and thinking, yeah, I'm ready. Today I'm going to go out and I'm going to wrestle. I'm going to contend for the faith. I'm not saying when Christmas comes, body slam your relatives, pin them to the mat, and preach to them. But what I am saying is, when people you know have the wrong ideas about the Bible and about God and about Jesus and the whole kingdom, you need to speak up and contend for the faith. So let's talk about how you do that. It's a biblical subject, Acts 19.8. Acts 19.8, this is speaking about Paul. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Paul argued persuasively. Now we think, oh, no, 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 no. We're never supposed to argue. That just turns people off. no. If you do it the right way, it'll turn them on. They're already turned off. And if you argue persuasively, it'll turn them on. That's Paul. Now we're going to look at a man named Apollos. And I'm not going to spend much time on this tonight. Acts 18.28. For he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. So Paul and Apollos and all the early apostles did this. Now, what we are told in scripture is that we are not to be quarrelsome. And what that basically means is that we don't, get, we don't lose our temper. We don't get upset when people disagree with us. However, we, we do need to argued like a lawyer. And that's basically what it's talking about. Paul argued like a lawyer. How many of you are up for that? All right, a few. <laughs> I'm having very few volunteers. Hopefully by the end, I'll win you over. But anyway, I'm talking about you make your case for Jesus. So that's what I want to talk about tonight. Now, I've, heard, I've actually heard several modern preachers, a lot of modern preachers, in fact, who actually have said the words, well, Paul and them, they did it wrong. I've had preachers come up to me while I'm preaching on the street or a college, you're doing it all wrong, brother. And they say that Paul was wrong if he did this. Oh, my goodness, I feel sorry for those poor suckers. Heaven's going to be very awkward in their first 30 minutes there as they meet Paul and Apollos. 
This is how you make a case. So let's take the case tonight, and this is my very favorite one, Psalm 51. This is what I wake up every morning of my entire adult life. This is the reason. Psalm 51, 13, it's actually a prayer of repentance by King David. But after he was repentant, he wanted to get back to the business that God had him doing, and that is this. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. You're not arguing with people to make yourself look smart. You want to win their heart. And that's the way you argue, passionately defending Jesus. Because I'm telling you, when you do that, you win them over. And if you don't do it, they will probably go on their merry way down the road that leads to destruction. So it's a beautiful thing. And then last, I'm going to read uh, 1 Peter 3.15. Scripture, some of us know, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared. I'm not one of those preachers that says, turn to your neighbor and say, just say it out loud. Prepared. prepared. Do it again. Prepared. Oh, that was more of you. That's good. That's where we have to be prepared. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And I'm telling you, that's the key. Uh, my friend who I travel with on college campuses is a neuroscience professor. And he is a former atheist. He was the he was the student rep for the, the faculty, the faculty rep for the student atheist club at the University of Georgia. He was totally hostile to the gospel. When someone like me showed up at Georgia uh, to preach about Jesus, he held up a little sign, ask an atheist. He wanted the message to go across, ask somebody smart, ask an atheist. Well, now he has a ministry called former atheist. Why? He said, well, because when he would go out, he, he didn't, I did not lead my friend to the Lord, but people like me did. He would go out and he would hammer them, hammer them, hammer them as a very a hostile atheist. And he said, oh, these people should be my enemies, but they're my frenemies. No matter how I hammer them, they're so nice to me. And they patiently answer every question I ask. And that won him over. That in the book of John. I actually didn't take the book of John. One of the uh, campus preachers said, just go home and read the book of John. Come back in a week and we'll talk. He only got to chapter 11 and he got saved. So we have to win them over. And we do that by being gentle and respectful. So now let's get to the, the subject on the table. Uh, this is basically what the... Culture tells us what the people, I'm going to tell you right now, at this stage of my life, uh, I would say a good 90% of the people I talk to start out with this in their mind. The Bible was just written by men. Any of you ever heard that? Oh, man, not many of you. The Bible was just written by men. And here's the real, uh, real axe to grind. It says, the Bible has been revised. It's been changed. It's been translated thousands of times over the centuries. How can anybody know what Isaiah and Jesus and Paul said? And the real uh, attack uh, for people who believe all that is that it's been doctored up. It's been monkeyed with. It's been changed. You guys change it every month. To, so it'll say what you want it to, what we need to hear. It's no longer reliable. Now, I don't know. Any of you ever heard those things? Yes. Okay, let me say this. Many of you sitting here tonight, maybe you're saying, well, I, well, that's all wonderful, Brother Kim, but I have no interest in all that. I'm not going to preach on a college campus. I'm going to tell you this. Your skill in these matters could very, very, very well determine where your children and grandchildren spend eternity. In this day and time, the culture is going to force these questions into their heart and their mind, and you need to be able to answer. Amen? 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 
for your children. Learn a few basic. Now, it's not hard. Let me tell you why. You don't have to learn 100 subjects. I do six subjects when I do a, a apologetics course. Really, only about three or four things you have to master. And this is one of them. The Bible's been written, changed, written by men, monkeyed with, revised. It's impossible to know it's reliable. How do we answer that objection? Well, first of all, how did we get the Bible? How did we get the Bible? You know, some people want to quibble over every little word. I do not do that because when I preach the gospel in America, I say, for God so loved the world. When I preach the gospel in Germany, I say, uh, for God hat den Welt geliebt. Different words. When I preach the gospel in Central America, I say, Jesus Christ is el mismo, e yo hoy para siempre. Different words, same message. So I don't quibble over every little word. How, here's how we, we, what do you do when you speak? You got ideas in your head, right? You got, come on. Don't you have ideas in your head you want to convey to other people? We have ideas in our mind that, that we want to get across to other people and we take those ideas and we turn them into words to convey them. God has something in his heart. And the Bible says at the end of eternity, when he shuts the door of heaven, there will be people there from every tribe, every language, every people and every nation. God has something he wants to convey to them and it's called the Bible. It's the Word of God. Now, I'm in deep trouble. Let's see here. I better re refocus. I'm only on page one of three pages. If I take, did men, let's just answer these questions. Did men write the Bible? Yes, they actually did. Now, if, I, if, if a CEO of a grand company wants to convey a message to all of his employees, he can simply uh, bring in a trusted secretary, personal assistant, and he can speak the words, in my, the things in his mind, he can speak them out to his secretary, and write, they write it down, and then they turn it into a memo and give it to the company. Everybody, every employee, everybody from the lowest to the greatest gets the memo, gets that message. He never picked up a pen. He never struck a key. He got what was in his mind to somebody else. Now, I'm not saying that's exactly how God conveyed the Bible to us, but in a way, it is. God had things in his heart and mind. He put them into the hearts of men, and they wrote it down. And we have those writings, the Bible. Amen? See, that's not hard. So what does the Bible say about itself? Well, let me just say this. There is one little part. The moral law, the Ten Commandments. God himself wrote those with his finger into stone tablets. So he did write the Ten Commandments directly. The rest of it he used people to write down. The Bible says of itself 2,000 times. Thus says the Lord. So the Bible is claiming this is God speaking to us. Now, let me just read a few scriptures here. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 uh, gives us an idea about that process a little bit. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So that's how the Bible says God carried people along, Moses and Isaiah and Paul and Luke and the author, the authors of Peter, he carried them along and inspired them to write down his words and his message. That's how we got our Bible. Now, I've got 2 Peter 3.15 up there. I'm not going to read it. Uh, just to know that Paul, I mean that Peter called Paul's writings scripture. Paul, Paul actually didn't even write some of his letters. The Bible gives us an idea. He just quoted them to people sitting beside him in a jail cell. They wrote it down. But Peter says they're scripture. So there we know. Okay, so how does God get it? Let's see. 2 Peter 3.16. 
All Scripture is God-breathed. That means Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. That's what I'm talking about tonight. You have to correct people's thinking about the Bible. And so how did God get our Bible? He used people. Isaiah, the prophet, was a literal genius. He had a massive vocabulary. He's called the Shakespeare of Scripture. So even though Isaiah had a massive vocabulary and was very intelligent, God used him to write. But you know what? There's another guy in the Bible named Amos, also a prophet. He was just a farmer. He did not have a big vocabulary, but God used Amos. He used real smart people, and he used people who did not have a formal education. And also, the book of Mark, which is really... Peter telling Mark uh, what he wanted him to, what the gospel of Jesus was all about. Mark wrote it down. Okay, this is scandalous. In the Greek, Mark's grammar is not great. Oh, that's horrible. God doesn't know good grammar. Mark didn't. God did. Mark did. But in the end, God got exactly what he wanted written down, written down. Amen? So now do you understand a little bit how we got the Bible? Now, as for this revision thing, as for this revision thing, we do not revise the Bible. We do not change the Bible's message. We don't uh, give it a, a, you know, we don't give it a new improve all the time. But you say, but there are new versions. I know that. There are new versions. Let me explain why, okay? All right, are you ready? How many of you know anything about Shakespeare? He wrote plays in uh, the 1500s. And Shakespeare said, the lady doth protest too much, methinks. How many of you have used methinks this week? I'll have a Big Mac, some fries, methinks. Anybody do that? No, we don't say methinks anymore, do we? Okay, now I'm going to see. Now this is actually my secret way of finding out how old some of you are. Okay, are you ready? Okay. In the 1940s, the British people, English, went around saying, oh, that's tickety-boo. Anybody in this room ever heard that? Tickety-boo. Okay, y'all don't have Britbox, so that's... But that's what they say, tickety-boo. Does anybody know what that means? That means everything's great. But we don't say that in our day and time. Now, here's my age test. How many of you remember, gee, Wally, you're swell. Now we're getting, oh, now we got some hands up. Who was that? Beaver. Leave it to Beaver in the 50s and probably even actually the early 60s. Leave it to Beaver was like, gee, Wally, you're swell. I don't say gee anymore. And if I talk about people swelling, it's because they've injured their ankle. Okay, let me give you some more examples. See how old you are. Oh, wow, that is groovy, out of sight, man, far out. Anybody in this room actually said those words? Oh, okay, now we got some takers. Yeah, that's my generation too. That's the 60s and into the 70s. We actually talked that way. Then came the 80s. Oh, gnarly, that's so rad, that's totally bogus. Oh, now we got more head shaking. Oh, yeah, yeah, people are owning up, yeah, 80s. And I tell my wife to this day, oh, sweetheart, you are totes adorbs. <laughs> Y'all know what totes, totes adorbs means? She's totally adorable, and she really is. But I know for a fact, uh, kids don't say that anymore. That's kind of old. Why did I say all that? Because language constantly changes. That's why we have new Bible versions. How many of you have read the King James Bible very much in your life? I'm not talking about the new King James, the the old King James, 1611. Okay, I remember I was preaching on the street one time. That's what we used to all have. And I said something like, David waxed bold in the Lord. And I was in Belgium and my interpreter said, what happened? You're talking now about candles? Candles? No, I'm talking about David waxed bold in the Lord. See, we don't talk that way anymore. So that's why we have newer translations that we don't change the message of the Bible. We simply uh, 
update it to our language. It's not to change the message. It's to update it for the way we speak. And our speech changes much faster than we could really adore. Uh, uh, adore. Tons of dorms, darling. Than we could imagine. Now, okay, let me just tell you why we can trust the Bible, okay? Here's how we can trust the Bible. Jesus preached, people wrote it down. Paul preached, people wrote it down. Paul sat in prison, he wrote letters. But you know what? That was 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago all this stuff was going on. How do we know that when I pick up my Bible, and I didn't even bring a Bible tonight, duh, anyway, how do I know when I read my Bible tonight, or much less if I open my Bible app, all that beautiful technology from 2023, how do I know that what I'm reading now is what Jesus really said? 2,000 years, let's be honest, that's a long time ago. How do I have any idea? And I'm going to tell you why. Well, first of all, now I'm going to really have some fun. Hoping I don't knock this down. Are you all still with me? Some of you are. The New Testament exploded into existence. Jesus preached, Paul preached, Peter preached, the apostles all preached and they spread the message. The Bible literally says they went everywhere and preached the message of Jesus. And so it also got recorded. It got written down at that time. Now, what, what did they, they did not have a computer. Paul did not have a, a laptop in prison. He wrote it on what we would call scrolls or parchments or papyrus. He wrote it down. And here's the truly amazing thing about the Bible. How many of these, these are called manuscripts, okay? Let's see. There we go. Those are manuscripts. We have manuscripts that exploded onto the scene in the first few centuries of the church. Now, there's a, the world's foremost uh, Bible, Bible archaeologist says there's no reason to date any book of the New Testament past 80. The first, in other words, Jesus lived from, there we go. Hey, that's why I brought this. This is a timeline. You can put the timeline up. There we go. Je Jesus' life is over here on the far, the, my far right. Jesus' life is there. Way up at the end, there's something called the Council of Nicaea. That is in the third, that's in the 300s. The Council of Nicaea. And all these people with this great conspiracy that the Bible's been changed. Man, you guys doctored it up. You cooked the books. You made it to say what you wanted it to say years, hundreds of years later. So uh, you could have this great political power and control people. That's the theory. At the Council of Nicaea, they say, and I've heard this literally a hundred times on college campuses. Oh, you guys, you totally revised and changed the Bible in uh, the Council of Nicaea. These greedy early church fathers did it for money. Did it for money? Are you kidding? These guys are getting eaten by lions. They're not in it for the money. So that's where they say it all got changed and messed with. Way up there. Now Jesus is here. Ten, you know, at the beginning, zero through basically 30, 33, around in there, and he was crucified. That is hundreds of years of difference. How can we know that it didn't get all doctored up uh, way up here at the Council of Nicaea? How can we possibly know? And it's because we have so many of these. You can go to museums around the world, those scrolls, and I, I appreciate the museums uh, loaning them to me tonight. I didn't have time for the white gloves, but we have these in museums all over planet Earth, including here in the United States of America. I have been privileged to see the Dead Sea Scrolls. I've been privileged to see very early manuscript evidence of the book of Colossians. I've actually looked this every now and then some... College kid will say some atheists, have you ever seen them? Yes, I have, with my own eyes. I've seen a very early manuscript of the book of Colossians, and I've seen these documents. They are all over the world. If someone wants to do a new translation today of the Bible, 
They start here. They start with those ancient manuscripts and they can still go in. They can still study them. They can still read them. You can still look at them. And you know what? If you understood Hebrew and Greek, you could open your Bible, compare them and be blown away that they are still accurate. What Jesus said, what Paul wrote, we still have proof of because we have so many of these. Now, I want to talk now about one of them. It's my favorite one. This is so beautiful. Can't imagine how beautiful this is. I shouldn't get fingerprints on it. This is called the Ryland Fragment. The Ryland Fragment contains uh, parts of John 18 on one side and the other. So it was at the corner of a page, and if you turned it, you were reading about Jesus before Pontius Pilate. This is so amazing. Hadn't seen this one yet. It's in England, but I've seen good pictures on the internet. Oh, there it is, the Ryland Fragment. You say, but it's just a fragment. Oh, how wonderful it is. Because that tells us what kind of paper it was written on. It tells us what kind of language was used, and... uh, uh, scholars, uh, even a German scholar, uh, one of the foremost archaeologists, biblically textual scholars in the world, he dates the Ryland fragment to about 90 AD. That's only 10 years after the New Testament was finished. And you say, well, that's a long time. Oh, not compared to other things. Like Plato, we have a few writings of Plato that we found, a few pieces, and they are hundreds of years after he lived. We have the Ryland fragment that goes to within about 10 years of the completion of the New Testament. The book of John. Mm, Beautiful. And what I really wanted to point out with all this is this. If you have all these beautiful manuscripts from literally and the latest any scholar, even the most liberal ex to grind scholar there is, would never date the Ryland fragment up to maybe 170. But uh, most scholars say it's very, very early. It's way back in 90. So the point is, you have all these, you know what, the most, the most greatest book of antiquity in the world is Homer's Iliad, you know, where we get Hercules and all that stuff. There's only 650 copies of that. Do you know how many New Testament manuscripts we have? Handwritten early New Testament manuscripts? 25,000. You could take all the writings of the Romans, all the writings of the Greeks, all the writings, and you could stack those manuscripts up on the floor. And you would get a pile four feet high if you stacked them up. If you started stacking up New Testament Manuscripts, you can literally stack them up for a whole mile. Phenomenal. Because most of them are not fragments. Most of them are complete New Testament manuscripts that are about two inches thick. And we have 25 to 30,000. Well, how many do we have? It just, wherever you want to stop counting. It goes all the way from the early New Testament to the printing press. We have thousands and thousands, and they're all available to anybody on planet Earth. You can look them up on the Internet. You can study them for yourself. You can see the pictures, and if you understand Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic, you could compare them with a modern New Testament. So my real point is this. If it all got doctored up here at the Council of Nicaea, way up here in like 312, 325, around in there, It's impossible because we have so many manuscripts in between thousands, 25,000, tens of thousands of manuscripts that go all the way in between. It's impossible to change it and doctor it up when you have that much evidence. Well, did y'all enjoy that? (laughs) God bless you, Pastor Mark.